communication. It's a big word. It's a big field. Uh, it's a big field in psychology. It's a big field in engineering. It's a big field today. You hear the word communication over and over again. Most of the people who talk on marriage say the most difficulty comes in marriage because of lack of communication. I'm always for pulling out the dictionary and looking up a word. I think I know what something means, uh, and yet I get out the dictionary and it gives me a little bit more insight into what a particular word means. So when I talk on something, the word communication, I want to look it up. To me, when I talk about communication, uh, in my slangy way of putting it, to me it's getting through, getting through to someone else, or they're getting through to you. And I've always thought that you get through to people through the senses, through sight, through sound, through touch. Through, uh, you can get through to people as you give them something to eat. <laughs> you can get through to the taste, to the smell. Uh, you can smell good, and that gets through to people. Uh, I don't know any other ways to get through except through the senses. The mind takes in what it sees. It takes in what it hears. It registers those things uh, that come in through the eye gate, the ear gate. These are the things and the ways that we can get through to people. So when I talk about getting through, I'm really talking about communication. The dictionary says we uh, communicate by words, messages, letters, interchange of, change of thoughts and ideas. And certainly that's what we're trying to do when we communicate with children. We're trying to get through some thoughts and ideas while they're still young, while they're still pliable, can listen uh, and get uh, what you're saying before they already think they know it all. And it's a little bit difficult to get through as uh, when they haven't been trained as children and then reach those teenage years and don't want to be told anything, especially if they haven't been used to being told anything. Mrs. John R. Rice says the first six years are the golden years of a child's life. Of course, she, she says uh, uh, the secular psychologists say that much of the character, much of the personality of a child is formed in those first six years. Then she thinks that the reason for that is because the ch mother has the child mainly to herself for those first six years. Uh, if if uh, there might be a babysitter once in a while, or perhaps the child's gone all day while a mother's out at work. But other than that, those situations, uh, there's no, the, the, most of the children aren't going to school. They are the mothers. They belong to the mother to teach and train and love and work with and play with for six years. And the personality is formed a, great, a lot in those first six years. I talked, when I talked to her, I say, Mrs. Rice, what about if the personality and character weren't formed the way they should have been in those first six years. A mother didn't know what to do through plain ignorance or just didn't know, did maybe what, didn't know where to go for help and hadn't been reared herself in the way that uh, she should have been. What do you do then? Mrs. Rice said, well, it'll just be harder. You'll just have to work double duty, triple duty. Ask God to help you to do something that's way too hard for you to do because of the fact that it's that much more difficult to train a child after those early years. Uh, as I stopped to think about communication with children, I tried to think, who communicated with me when I was a child? Why don't you stop to think, who, who were those aunts and uncles that meant most to you? Why did they mean most to you? Even that now that you're as an adult, what are some of the things you can remember that they did for you or with you or about you that caused you to re uh, for the, know that they got through to you? Uh, who were those teachers, those adult teachers, who uh, were able to teach you more than other people because they could get through, and it was in different ways. Some got through by being fun with you. Some got through just because you could see they were in such earnest, they had such an earnest desire, an intense desire to help you and give you material that they felt that you ought to have. Uh, stop to think how people communicated with you when you were a child. And I believe that will help you communicate with other children. You might ask, well, why is it so important? I don't even have children of my own. Oh, but uh, say, say you're a, a lady in your 70s, you're a widow lady, and maybe you don't even have your own grandchildren or uh, you ha don't have nieces or nephews, but you walk into the church building and there are children in that church building who need a touch from an adult. 
they need to know there doesn't have to be that generation gap and that uh, you, you can uh, show them that you care for them and that you love them. There's not a person listening to this tape who shouldn't want to be able to communicate with children better than you do. I want to communicate with children better than I do. I, I know that they're a key to keep me happy. That as I watch ch children and, and as I see their uh, child, their, the, the, not their childishness, but even that can teach me not to be childish as an adult and stamp my foot and want my own way, but their childlikeness, I hope they're childlike when they're children. Some are so serious they're not even childlike when they're children. But as I watch their childlikeness and watch them at play, I can learn so much from them. I can see... Uh, how they learn and I can see how adults can still learn if they'll be more childlike in their attitudes. As I sat down and thought about the people who had communicated with me, I thought of a, my mother's brother, Uncle Gene. Uh, it was during the Second World War or soon after when I wanted ice skates. I was still a child. I hadn't reached, I don't believe, teenage years yet. And uh, I had never had ice skates and I, I was dying for a pair of ice skates. Uncle Gene happened to be home around Christmas time to visit, happened to be around our area, though he was from a long, long way, a ways away, and I'll never forget what he did for me. Uh, he got through. He got through that he cared about my having something that I wanted. Perhaps he was doing it for his sister, my mother. I don't know why he was doing it. I don't know uh, what his motives were. I just know that I felt very special, very cared for, and uh, uh, very loved by Uncle Gene when he took time out of his vacation time to take me to the county seat and walk to place after place after place trying to find ice skates for me when he saw that I wanted them. They just weren't to be had. Uh, it was during that wartime or after the wartime when you couldn't get bicycles, uh, you couldn't get uh, sports equipment. It was very, very difficult. People just weren't spending the time. Factories and companies had been converted into making things for the war effort, and you just didn't, they didn't have the materials, they didn't have the time, and you just couldn't get much in the way of uh, something like that. Uh, we, we'd go to uh, store after store. I can recall his opening the doors for me, treating me like a lady, though I was a young tomboy, a little child, treating me special, going in to find out, not giving up. And when the clerk would say, you're not going to find them, you just, it doesn't that always get you when clerks say, you're not going to find those any place. They just aren't to be had. You wonder, well, how do they know? Have they really been up and down the streets and found out that there are no ice skates? Did they look? Well, usually they do know. They've heard other uh, customers come in and tell them that they've looked all over and can't find them. But Uncle Gene didn't take that. You know, I thought, oh, he'll listen to them. I'd be so, t I'd be terrified when the clerk would say that. And we'd go on to another store, and Uncle Gene wouldn't, didn't say a thing about stopping. And we kept at it and kept at it and finally found one pair of ice skates. They weren't uh, exactly what I wanted. They weren't the heavy, beautiful white leather. They were more of a synthetic somehow uh, type of material, uh, just like when you did finally get a bicycle at that time. They didn't have the nice bicycle tires. They were little tiny tires and ones that I don't think would have taken much uh, beating, much of a uh, wear. But uh, that's the kind of ice skates I got, and we came home with ice skates. I was so thrilled. I was so excited. It got through to me in a way that I've never forgotten it. I remember going after ice skates. I, Uncle Gene communicated with me because he spent time with me and because he went after an object just as if he had to have it for himself. Do you, take a child, do you ever take a child's wishes into consideration to that point? It's so easy to say, well, we can't find it. Uh, sorry, I tried. Uh, but we wouldn't do that if it was something we wanted. We would go and go and go until we found that thing that we felt that we needed or wanted. So when you want to communicate with a child, if it's at all possible, at least once in a while, go out of your way to help that child get what he wants just as if it were for yourself. You can't always do it. You can't always do that even for yourself when you want something. And a child needs to know that you can't always do it. But once in a while, just once in a while, could you do it? I believe you would be saying an awful lot to that child. Uncle Gene surely did to me. He did something that I haven't forgotten at 46 years of age. Um, Aunt Leela always smelled good. She always had a lot of pretties in her bathroom. And uh, she had powder and cologne, and I don't even know that it was that expensive. I doubt that it was. But she communicated with me. 
uh, I'd go to church with her and sit up against her, and she just smelled good. And I, I, I recall saying to her, um, when Uncle Carl passed away, I said, Aunt Lila, now you're not going to quit wearing all that pretty smelly stuff. She said, no, no, you girls see that I get it. You know, and so we send her the perfume, and I don't even know if she uh, likes it all that much. But when we think of Aunt Lila, we think about how she smells so good. And that communicates to a child. I've often said, when you go into your Sunday school class or go into your class of children you teach or your bus route around children, wear bright colors, smell pretty, court them, do things that will let them know you think they're special and you fixed up for them. Just like you would court uh, or you would uh, fix up for a, a man who hopefully is courting you uh, when you were uh, uh, in that courting stage. Uh, fix up for children as you would fix up for your boyfriend, as you fix up for your husband. Smell good. Look good. Uh, be attractive as you possibly can. And you know what's beautiful about this? Children don't care if you're pretty of face. Uh, as much as they care that you have put yourself out a little bit for them, they look at what you wear and whether or not, uh, and then that doesn't have to be expensive either. It just needs to be clean and colorful and you need to smell pretty. And you can win children. You can communicate to them that you think they're special. Aunt Leela always had a wrapped candy, not a lot of uh, rich stuff that would ruin, ruin us or anything like that, but some wrapped candy was always around the house and bananas. Oh, I, I, I remember my husband talking about his, when he was a little child, he went to a neighbor's with his dad, and they had a, people just didn't have bananas like they do now. Bananas were something really special. And when he went, they went at lunchtime to go get a part for the, in the farm, uh, for the farm. I can't remember the whole story, but my husband said he, when he was, he was just a little boy, and he looked at the bananas on the table. And he said, those bananas just make my just make my eyes go back and forth. And he took his hand and went back and forth. And the, the neighbors g took the hint and said, do you want one? And, of course, the parents were embarrassed, you know. But uh, uh, bananas. Aunt Lila always had bananas in the house. I don't know whether it was for her or Uncle Carl or for the kids that came by. It seemed like they always were saw to it that there were a, a bunch of bananas laying around when my friends and I happened by the house. Um, Aunt Ruth, Uncle Jean's wife, uh, came in to the Christmas gathering of the aunts and uncles and cousins, always came into the Christmas gathering with a tall box of gifts, all wrapped. I doubt, those were in the years right after the Depression when I was a child and, and in the years of the uh, Second World War, like I say, and uh, I doubt that they were expensive gifts. I don't remember. It really doesn't matter. It just got through that she had spent time wrapping a t huge box of gifts that everybody, all the cousins, all the aunts, all the uncles had something from Aunt Ruth and that she had spent time wrapping them. I doubt that they had spent a lot of money. I doubt there was money to spend. But those wrapped gifts got through to me. Uh, you want to communicate with a child? When you, when you see something, you know that that just fits them. And it's ti just a tiny little thing. Don't just give it. Don't just buy it and give it to them. Wrap it up. Let them know that they're special, special enough that you took time to wrap a gift. I think most children like to unwrap gifts. I think adults do. I do. I like to, somebody said to me, said, wrap it up. She'll like it no matter what it is. Uh, make something of it by wrapping it up. Uh, it's fun to get a present. And, it, and I know you can communicate with children through wrapping it up. Uh, Dad, I've, ta I've had a whole tape about Dad, and I've talked about Dad and Mom a lot, so I won't be talking that much probably. I'm trying to think of other people, but I always, I've told you Dad... Uh, communicated with me by keeping him, uh, keeping me by him when he was working. Uh, I, I, he communicated how to work. He communicated that work was important, that it could be fun, and to finish the job by keeping me right by him. Oh, there's so many ways that you can communicate. Some of the things we want to communicate to children are love, play, work, praying, teach, teaching, and training. These are some of the main things. We want them to know we love them. We want them to feel loved. We want that to be communicated to them. Again, let me use Mrs. John R. I. She talks about her baby, Joy, the youngest of her six daughters. How that the first six weeks of Joy's life, she just spent time taking her tiny little baby lady fingers and just playing with them and shaping them and uh, 
rubbing them and and loving on joy and kissing her and uh, she talks about how, how joy is such a loving person and I know joy and I know that's that is true she communicated love to her spent time just looking at her enjoying her and you can do that just a look just a look at a child and uh, you communicate in your eyes whether they're special or not they can see it in your eyes uh, when you play with them do you enjoy it or are you just doing it just to spend the time with them and get them out of the way and hope that you can hurry back to your work they know the difference they want people to play with them who want to play with them who give their whole mind to that play and watch their child playing and enjoy watching their child playing you know how it is as adults uh, you say, let's go out to eat together, and the person says, well, I, okay, I'm not hungry, but I'll go with you. It's not as fun as the person who says, yeah, oh, good, uh, I, uh, I'm going to get one of those big salads. Maybe the person ha isn't hungry, that hungry, or trying to diet, but at least they say, oh, I'm going to get one of those big salads, and you feel like that they want to go, that they're enjoying it with you. You don't like people just to go, just to humor you. It's What's fun is when they want to go, and they're enjoying it too. Well, children are like that. They want you to enjoy their play with them. Uh, Dr. Howes often tells the story of Dr. Ri Dr. John R. Rice just, just in recent years. Dr. Howes was looking for him after a meeting and couldn't find him. And uh, he, he looked all over, asked the people around the church, and uh, they were ready to go to their motel, ready to go eat, I don't know. Uh, all of a sudden, he saw the great Dr. John R. Rice down playing hopscotch with some kids. How, how exciting. To, to be able to stay childlike, not childish, but childlike all your life so that you can communicate with children. Uh, oh, that, that you can learn to pray a child's prayer. Uh, we have a man at Hiles Anderson College who is highly intelligent. Uh, <coughs> he uh, has been a professor in a, one of the largest universities in the nation, and uh, he's well known for his work with in, in the fields of engineering, science, uh, computer work, and all of this. But when he prays, he prays as a child would pray. And I believe the students really enjoy it. Uh, he prays so simply. Now, dear Jesus, you know we're here today and we need you. Just so simple. Like a child. And it's always, we always get excited when he's called on to pray because he, we know it's going to be uh, really special. Because uh, he prays like a child prays. And you can pray like a child prays. You can learn how to pray from a child if you pray with a child. And instead of trying to teach them your jargon, learn their way of praying, which is so much more direct and so much more simple. And I believe God answers a child's prayers. When you teach, when you train the child, uh, so many times you can get through and set um, a better way if you're not so intense with it. But just go toward it maybe even in an indirect what uh, indirect way so much teaching has come to us those of us who feel we've learned a little bit if you go back it's come to us indirectly you know perhaps the least effective method of reaching a goal in human relations is to go directly toward that goal perhaps the least effective method of reaching a goal in human relations is to go directly toward that goal now that might seem funny most of the time you say you've got a goal go to it go after it go get it but in human relations many many times yes set a goal something needs to be taught to the child but maybe find some indirect ways to get it into the child's mind to to see to it they get get the training and teaching some can be direct but some teaching can be very indirect it doesn't have to be a sit down i'm going to teach you this we're going to have a lecture but just something that you get to them indirectly as you play together, as you work together, as you pray together, and as you love the child. So many verses in the Word of God about when to teach, the special ones, of course, very, very special ones that I love. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign up, upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house 
and on thy gates. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, And ye shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now we know that we that doesn't mean we don't believe God means that we're supposed to lecture and preach all the time. It's just that your children will see you constantly when you're sitting at the table, when you're walking down the street, when you're driving down the road. They're going to see you do the things that they should do, and you're going to have going to have little times that you can put in a word here and there all the time, all day long, training, teaching. Proverbs 22, 6, the famous verse, Train him a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's wonderful to know that we can get through to children. Mom got through to me. Uh, she made me a little lunch for a friend of mine, for me and a friend of mine. Uh, we took it out under the weeping willow tree, and she fixed it special. She cut the sa peanut butter and jelly sandwich in fourths so that we had little triangles and she put a little napkin on the tray and uh, just made a special little lunch that said, uh, you and your friend are pretty important. It communicated it, something to me. So much more than getting the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I could have had that, you know, get a slab of bread and put on. The way she fixed it said that my friend and I were, were as important as she and a friend when she happened to have a friend over for lunch. It said a lot. When I was a little child, she went and bought red Scotty dog buttons to put on my white dress that she made, a white seersucker dress. And I remember the Scotty dogs. She didn't put on buttons that an older person might choose. She put on buttons that I would like. She got me another piece of material that had airplanes on it and letters, like airmail letters. I remember it. And it was, I was five or six years old. It got through to me because she left her world and chose something that would be something I would enjoy that was in my world. I remember Uncle Carl going over to an old schoolhouse across from our house, and it had a ledge all around it. It was one of those two-room, it was a two-room schoolhouse. And I, t I ran that ledge, and there had, people had taken sticks and worked in the cement between the bricks so that there were places you could put your fingers in and go around that ledge just to fly in and walk that schoolhouse ledge. And uh, it was a little bit dangerous, but not too much. But Uncle Carl didn't say anything about the danger and didn't say, now watch out, watch out. He timed me walking around that schoolhouse. He couldn't have wanted to go over there and time me walking around that schoolhouse. He had to have been wanting something he wanted to do. Uh, a lot more than timing me walking around a schoolhouse. But he spent time. These people got through to me. They communicated. They showed that they loved me. Matthew 18, 2, 3 says, And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I think usually when I thought of that verse and different verses about Jesus and children, I probably thought it was a perfect little clean child, you know. And uh, I, I think the pictures all show, uh, just like they show Jesus as an artist's conception and probably nothing at all like he looked with the long hair and all, they show a perfect little child who looks uh, so special and so sweet and clean and all this. And I imagine it was just a child like any other child, even if the child was special and nice when it was with Jesus. I suppose it was just like any other child having its problems and causing problems. Uh, Matthew 19, 13 through 15 says, Then there were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. He loved little children. You can love little children too. I think about people who have communicated with my children. What My children are teenagers now, but as they were younger, and these people usually still communicate with them when they're teenagers. That's what's something. As I go back and think about the uh, adults who communicated with me and got through to me when I was a child, they also were the ones who got through to me when I was a teenager and also still get through to me as an adult. Once you learn how to communicate with children, you probably are going to be able to communicate with all age groups, uh, my children. Annie Ruth McGuire, friend of mine from Chattanooga. She wasn't just my friend. She was the friend of my children. And uh, she'd get something going, like she had something going with David as a child. 
Uh, now, you're going to think this is bad, maybe, because you're going to... It, it was Coca-Cola. Uh, David thought Annie Ruth and he and Annie Ruth were the only ones who liked co Coca-Cola. And Annie Ruth uh, uh, had some, always had some Coke around the house, and she'd see that he got some Coke. And even to this day, as she, she comes, she came uh, uh, last year for the Spectacular, and she, here she came with a radio in the form of a Coke bottle. Now, they don't drink that much Coke. They talk about it. There's a line between them that... Uh, they they ha have in common Coca-Cola. Uh, one of, uh, of my friends, Connie Brown, has a son named Tony. And, uh, one, and a, a mutual friend of Connie and myself uh, would go over, used to go over to the house and, uh, to, to be with Connie. And Connie used to say, uh, come talk to me. Her husband uh, has night at work, and she's, a, she's alone, and, and the, uh, her, this mutual friend would be over to talk to Connie and instead would be up in the bathroom with Tony uh, leaning over the bathtub, looking at his toad or frog or turtle or whatever it was, playing with it, or playing with some of the toys he had for his bathtub. And to this day, every time Tony sees this friend of his mother's and mine, uh, it, he forgets all of his own friends and goes toward her. And Connie says, you like Tony better than you like me. Uh, well, see, no, not really. Uh, and Connie knows that and really likes that uh, this friend enjoys Tony and Tony enjoys the friend. But the friend doesn't spend all the time with the mother. She spends, she's also a friend of Tony. That makes so much difference, a handicapped child. Uh, how, what a thrill it is to be able to communicate with a child who isn't able to talk very well. And so no one else enters his world. Wayne Graham, a boy I had in my class when uh, many years ago, about 10 or, uh, no, 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 about 20 years ago now, a uh, little, little kid in a wheelchair, and he could go, uh, 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 sort of like that. And when I'd come up to him, I'd say, Wayne, you really love spinach, don't you? And laugh and throw back his head, and I was getting through to him. Uh, Wayne, you hate ice cream, don't you? Uh, uh, uh. He liked ice cream. Oh, you can, you can enter the world, and you can go in toward a child. I don't care what type of child he is. I don't care if what kind of child. And as you communicate with them, you'll be the type of person who also possibly will be able to dis discipline them. Mothers, you have to discipline children so much that you feel sometimes you don't have time to communicate in any other way and enjoy and love and train them. Of course, Psalm 127.3 says, Lo, children are our heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So it should be a pleasant thing. But then also Proverbs 13.24 uh, 13, says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Proverbs 19:18 Chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. All this has to be put together and balanced. Ephesians 6:4 And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You can communicate with children. We all can. We have to ask the Lord to give us help to do it. And we have to want to do it and we have to love them and then he'll he'll give us the ways if we'll look into everything, look into our hearts and find ways uh, uh, that we can leave our world and enter theirs so that we can win them to ourselves and to the Lord. We are so afraid of teenagers. I don't know why we get so afraid when a person passes from 12 to 13. Perhaps it's because we haven't really known them when they were 12. Perhaps it's because we haven't really entered into the world of the child and learned them and loved them and spanked them and enjoyed them when they were a child. Uh, just as people who reach 40, that magic number of 40, you know, they think they're old all of a sudden, then they get 40 and see they feel no different than they did when they were 39. Or Mrs. Stevens has written an article in Christian Womanhood that says when she reached the age of 60, she thought all of a sudden she was going to have to take off her high-heeled shoes, put on slippers, uh, sit back in a rocking chair, and do nothing. And she found out the morning she was 60, she felt no different from what she felt at 59. Uh, the, the same should be true between 12 and 13. Uh, at least we should feel as comfortable around a person the day he turns 13 as the day he was 12. I think the fact that we don't feel comfortable around the person makes them feel even more ill at ease about their adjustments in life. Of course they're, as Dr. Heil says, uh, in, in a, to a certain extent in a no man's land. 
but perhaps they wouldn't be, and he says they wouldn't be so much in a no man's land if we were entering again that world with them, giving them assurance, giving them confidence, giving them uh, some uh, idea that, it, that they're going to be all right and that uh, they're going to find their way in life. I realize that they are re re uh, reaching their, those years when they're learning to pull away from parents and learning to pull away from home so they can stand to leave home. If they didn't try to work at that for a while, they wouldn't be able to take it when they did have to leave home. Uh, there were, again, there were some people in my life who communicated with me as a teenager. I'm so happy for that. People who have those who know how to communicate and get through to them when they're teenagers have, have hope of getting through their te teenage years halfway intact. But people who do not have those who can communicate with them don't understand them and let them know they don't understand them. And uh, then they, they really begin to feel that they're losing their minds themselves sometimes. That's a terrible thing. Uh, the same thing happens when people, sometimes when people reach the uh, middle age or what they consider is the time to call themselves middle-aged. Sometimes it happens when a person decides, now I'm old. Uh, we, we put these things up in our own minds and make them so much bigger. They are big. And yet if we, ha we can handle them gracefully. Mrs. Holbrook has a tape called Growing uh, Older Gracefully. And I believe we can go through teenager years more gracefully than we do, than maybe we have or maybe our children have. If we just again stop to think, what does communication mean? It means getting through by words or messages or letters, interchange of thoughts and ideas. Still, you're wanting to get through that you love the teenager. You're wanting to be able, if at all possible, to play with the teenager. I don't mean play the little games like children, but what does a teenager, what are they liking to do? Enter that world and hope that you can go with them to a certain extent. You'll not want to stay with them all the time as much as when they were children. They'll need to do some of their playing, some of their fun, some of their uh, partying with their church friends and all like that without mom and dad. But that you can still do some playing with them. Instead of uh, playing little games outside, some of that still can happen. Perhaps it'll be playing in that you... Uh, go with them to pick out clothes and enjoy sitting and watching them uh, pick out their clothes without a lot of preaching from you, hoping that direction and guidance have been given enough that, they'll, that, you won't, that you'll be able to sit there and enjoy what they're doing uh, and what they're choosing when they pick out their clothes. It might be going with them or taking them to a special uh, football game. I don't know what it's going to be. But uh, you may have to sit back a little ways and be a little bit in the shadows more, but still be there so they can come up to you. I remember be, go, going out skating with a group of young people when I was a teenager, and I didn't want the older people out with me, but I wanted them there so I could go leave my, uh, oh, I forget, it seemed like I wanted to take off my watch in, in case I fell and broke my watch. I wanted to the older people there so I could go over and say how, uh, how to, did when I fell did could you see anything you know, I want them there and so in a way they were playing with me and I think teenagers would want the older people there more if the older people uh, knew when to enter in when to step back there's an art in that recently I saw someone uh, a person who is a quite a man in himself serving another man who was older and needed help and I said, how did you learn to serve? How do you know? How did you get the art of when to stand back and when to come forward? And I think that's what we're having to learn with teenagers. When do you get out of the way and when do you, are you wanted? And uh, when, when are you, you, it's, it's an art, but we can learn it if we have the desire to learn it and really want to learn it. We could oh, pray, pray for teenagers. Uh, enter into prayer and tell the Lord that some of the problems they have are too hard for you. You don't know the answers to them, but he does. And as they know that you're in earnest prayer about them, not because they're a heathen, but just so that God will guide them day by day so that they'll come through the teenage years ready to face their 20s and, again, like I say, intact, ready to go, and not so hurt and so crushed by things that have happened that they feel like they're not able to go on into being what the Lord wants them to be for the rest of their lives. Again, teaching and training can take place, but it might need to be even more indirect. 
than with children. May I repeat, perhaps the least effective method of reaching a goal in human relations is to go directly toward that goal. Now, in work, you, 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 you need to do the dishes done. That's the goal. Usually, you go right toward it. it that's the best thing to do. I'm going to get them done, get them out of the way, go right in there and get them done. In human relationships, it might be best to wait and pick up patterns. Now, with children, often you can discipline and, and bring out things and talk with them on the spot and should. The younger they are, the more you should because they won't remember what the offense was or what the thing is that you feel needs to be discussed. But as they get to be teenagers, watch for patterns rather than constantly uh, getting after them every time they do something wrong. They feel like you're on them 16 times a day. If what they do is a pattern that you've already registered in their mind, uh, they, they, they come in and slam the door and don't speak to the people that are in the house with you, uh, then every time they do it, you don't have to bring it out. What you need, you register that this is a pattern that needs to be dealt with and talked about, and then in an indirect way, possibly at family devotions, you go over it with the whole family again. You already have registered that that's a pattern. Now, some of us are action people. We want to do something right away. We want to tell everybody immediately what their sins are and preach them a sermon. And it's very difficult to sit back and wait for patterns to develop and then just work with a person because they have a pattern of a problem. Uh, I was working with a girl last year during the school year who uh, said something pretty... Mm, it was it was bordered on insubordination said something pretty harsh about a staff member but i happened to i know the girl pretty well and i know people who know her pretty well and as far as i know it was the only time that year she said anything like that i didn't even bother to mention it to her i happened to know she was having family problems she still shouldn't have said this but she uh it wasn't characteristic of her it wasn't one of her main problems, and that there, there were other things I needed to be dealing with her on. And therefore, that wasn't something to really uh, zero in on, I didn't think. Uh, she also was having migraine headaches at that time. Uh, so there were reasons now, uh, just because you have a migraine headache doesn't mean you can say whatever you want to say. You need to learn how to handle yourself when you're sick, when you're having emotional problems, so that you don't ha hurt other people during that time. You may even have to see to it that you remove yourself from people. If you haven't learned to control yourself when you are sick or feel helpless in some way or have had, are having a lot of problems, you, that does not give you a license to say whatever you want to say. Yet, it wasn't something I felt at that time I needed to get on to her about, unless it developed and kept developing. You know, I think that's why, uh, you know how it is when there's a, a thievery, or there's a robbery, and uh, we say, oh, the police come in, they want this big report, but they won't ever do anything. Now, sometimes it's true, I suppose, and in some police departments it's true. But a lot of times, they're having to get a pattern. They're having to watch, and they know that if they get all, the, they say, why are they taking this all down? They're not going to do anything. Yes, they are. They're going to keep all of these reports, keep them together, and they'll, they're looking for a pattern. Uh, we had one of those robberies at our house years ago in Chattanooga, and uh, they took down all the information. We didn't hear about it ever, ever, ever. And finally, uh, they caught a 13-year-old boy who was responsible for over 100 burglaries in the Highland Park area of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And they had wa wa watched and waited for a pattern, and they, and they got the boy and found out that he was responsible. But they didn't have much information, didn't have a way much, pretty slick, with a lot of older people working with him. And they hadn't had much of a way to get him until they got the pattern. Uh, a doctor who just immediately zeroes in on everything and gets after you about everything that when you go to see him and says, I think you have this, I think you have that, and you go out thinking you have a certain disease, instead of they're watching for a pattern. Again, a lot of us want to go to a doctor who immediately give us a medicine, and we want immediate relief. And we don't know that he's having to A good doctor will watch over a period of time and see what a pa patterns you have before he'll uh, say you might have some uh, a, a big disease and start giving you medication that he really doesn't have to give you. Who communicated with you when you were a teenager? I believe this is going to be your best way to figure out how you can communicate with teenagers. And by the way, whether you have your own teenagers or not, try to ask God to give you a desire to communicate with them. How, again, they need you 
on that bus route, in that Sunday school class, just as you walk down the aisle at church, they need for you to be able to stop and ask them about something that's there, something they're interested in. Uh, again, Aunt Leela communicated with me when I was a teenager. I uh, needed a correspondence course. Uh, I, I just couldn't seem to get at it. I couldn't get it done. I had ordered the correspondence course from the U University of Pennsylvania. It was a course I, I needed to take to fill out a, a particular major I was trying to do, and I was still a teenager. And uh, I, I should have done it day by day, but I, I couldn't seem to do it. I just couldn't seem to find the time. I had a couple younger sisters around home, and I, you know, they were in and out of the house, and uh, we were busy around the house, and Aunt Leela and Uncle Carl didn't have any children. It was quiet up at their house, and I called Aunt Leela. I asked Dad, could I go up there and just take that correspondence course and work all day long on it every day until I got through. Uh, Aunt Leela closed off the house. I was just thinking about this the other day. Who else would have somebody do this for them? And uh, she's not even a blood relative. She's uh, just my parents' best friends. Aunt Leela and Uncle Carl stood up with them when my parents were married. Uh, years and years and years, they've just been part of the family. Uh, Aunt Leela closed off the house except for the kitchen and the bathroom. And when Uncle Carl came home from work, she and I, uh, Uncle Carl stayed out in the kitchen and talked. They, she gave me the li dining room table. I uh, parked my typewriter up there, left all my things all over her dining room table. Aunt Leela would fix especially good lunches, dinners for me. Steak dinner, I like beef steak. I thought that was the best, and I still do. I think I'd like it better than T-bones or porterhouse steak or anything like that. Good old, we called it beef steak. I guess it's round steak. I don't know what you call it. Good old Midwestern beef steak. She'd fix me a steak dinner so that if I worked and worked and worked, I'd be rewarded. I'd think, oh, I'm going to go out there and eat dinner with Aunt Lena and Uncle Carl. And for, in about five or six days, I completed a course from the University of Pennsylvania, or Penn State, uh, and got an A in it. At working, working all day long, just lesson after lesson after lesson. You know, that said she cared. She cared enough to close off her house and just give it to me so that I could have quiet, so I could have uh, someone waiting on me. So all I had to do, I, I was babied and pampered so that I wouldn't feel put upon because I had to work all day long uh, getting that correspondence course. And you don't forget things like that. I don't even know if I appreciated it that much at the time. But somehow or other, it must have gotten through to me. I remember it. Uncle Carl took my friends and me to football games. I'd, I'd uh, two or three girls, uh, we'd want to go off to a, an away football game and three or four times during my high school years, at least three or four times. When uh, there weren't rides and I'd say, Uncle Carl, I need to, I want to go to my, uh, the football game. And he'd get in his car and take us off to a football game. Uh, those, those things, they say something. They communicate. Uh, do you ever take time for a teenager to, to do something for, that he wants to do? Not drag him someplace you want to go that you think would be good for him, but go with him to where he wants you. Boo Balgen. Uh, uh, he was a foul-mouthed man. <laughs> he uh, he uh, was that truck garden operator where I was, a, wh where I was at, uh, 12, oh, 11, 12, and 13, I think, still uh, working for him some in the truck garden, picking the tomatoes and cucumbers. But one day he said, will you stay and go to the house and help my wife with lunch? Wow, it got through. I said, he thinks I'm dependable. He needs me. His wife needs me at the house. I don't even know what he wants me to do, but I'm going to find a way to do it because he needed me. Again, Dad kept me working by him. He had a job. He had a, the restaurant, and I was a waitress, and I knew that he, I was important to him in that restaurant. And he said sly little things sometimes, too. Once when I was working at the dime store, uh, oh, I'd broken my ribs. Let's don't go into that story. It's when my plane took off at a rodeo with one of those chains. Uh, several planes took off, and I went flying across the rodeo grounds and uh, the Wymore Arbor State Park and broke some ribs. And I wanted to go on to work the next day. Or, uh, and I was all taped up and hurting like crazy. I'd been so unconscious the night before. And uh, I think he was kind of proud. He was the kind that always went on to work no matter what. And I, I felt he was proud of me when he said to the woman at the dime store, when he said, I don't know if she'll be any help to you. She's uh, not, I don't know if she'll be any good or not, but she had to come to work. And that, I, I, he communicated something to me. It got through that he was proud that I wanted to go on to work. Uh, one time, Grandma Zugmar, my dad's mother, uh, I was hearing my twin cousins, just a little bit younger, the three of us, all girls, uh, 
she heard us talking about a family in town. Oh, we envied the girls in that family. They were all thin and willowy and lovely and sleek and uh, classy and sharp and cool and all those words, you know. We thought they were just something. And Grandma Zugmeyer said, uh, you girls are prettier. Pre prettier. <laughs> I, I, we almost got mad at Grandma. We thought, oh, she doesn't know anything. So that's a, you know, we wanted to be like those cool, sharp girls, you know. But she got something through to me, that I was okay the way I was. I was made the way I was. I was supposed to be the way I was. And also that it isn't always so great to be the cool one. That cool people, it's hard for them to learn because they can't get excited about anything. They've got to remain cool, you know. And so that's, it's hard for them to learn about anything. She got quite a bit through to me, and it still is there. She say, uh, that, little, that little statement might have saved me some things. I can remember as, even as an adult wanting to get in, and I could have gotten in with some of the more cool people. You know what I mean? The ones who sort of sit back and don't, aren't ta don't take an active part in the church. And they're there, and they're okay, and they're Christians, but uh, they, they don't get excited about the things in the church, and they, uh, they give little critical remarks. And uh, because I tried to be fun, I could have gotten in, even though I didn't fit with some of them, I could have gotten in at different uh, with them. And uh, it was kind of considered sharp to be in with them. And I'm so glad that someone got through to me that it isn't always so great to be in with the cool people. Uh, our preacher says, enjoy what they enjoy. Enter their world. Think on their world. See what it is they like. Again, these are the great men, Dr. Dr. Hiles, Dr. Rice. Dr. Rice and uh, Mrs. Rice, just a few years ago, they're 85 now, not too many years ago, they and their six daughters and all their 20-some grandchildren at that time, or however many, and they have great-grandchildren now, uh, someone let them have a bus to go to Disney World together. The whole family went to Disney World, and Mrs. Rice says uh, that their that their girls, their daughters, disgraced them, said all the way down to Disney World, the grandchildren were quiet, nice, and respectful, and polite, but their own daughters said they just sang and carried on, sang foolish songs all the way down there. Of course, she was teasing, and they entered right into it and liked it, but she was uh, throwing off on her daughters for being so loud, and the grandchildren not being so loud. And uh, we said, well, did you go on the ride? She said, oh, Dr. Rice and I went on Space Mountain. And she said, if I hadn't had Dr. Rice to lean against, it would have been terrible. And Space Mountain's a pretty, pretty hard, fast ride. They entered into the world of their teenage grandchildren, and they're loved by their grandchildren. M of course, why wouldn't they be? You say, but the teenagers in my life are so, they're so rebellious. They're so hard to get along with. I don't know. I just, they, they act so hostile. Okay, stop to think. If they do, perhaps they haven't gotten all the training and teaching and love and prayer that they needed as they were growing up. Stop to think why they're hostile. They're probably upset with themselves. Don't you get hostile when you're upset with yourself and sometimes you take it out on your husband, you take it out on your roommate, you take it out on your sister because you're upset with yourself. Uh, a teenager who appears hostile is probably mostly upset with himself. Or uh, sometimes they're upset with someone else. Another, their peers, their peers haven't treated them right. The, 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 the other kids. So they take it out on you. Or maybe they feel helpless. They're, try to think of all the reasons why they might appear ho uh, hostile. They may be tired. You know, it takes a lot. They have a lot of energy, but they expend a lot of energy. And it takes a lot of energy to grow as fast as they're growing and to keep up with what all the body changes that are happening within them. Uh, they feel like they fail a lot. They don't have the keys we have to inner doors, you see. We have, we, it's a lot easier for us. We already had so many experiences that show us what won't work and what will work. And if we're uh, uh, smart at all, a uh, little bit smart at all, it doesn't take so many trying of keys to every door because we already know some keys, some doors won't work and some doors that will. So they have some frustrations we don't have. Uh, don't become impatient with them. Uh, a doctor shouldn't make a quick judgment. Uh, if he does, it'll sometimes kill the patient. We can kill a teenager by making a quick judgment. They're rebellious. Okay, they appear rebellious. They appear hostile. But get below it and see the heart of the teenager and, and, and stay around them long enough and take that hostile behavior long enough that you can get below it and see what really is the problem. 
quit giving your opinions. Let's. I don't think we're going to communicate with them by constantly giving our opinions and giving our judgments. Uh, you know, once we start diagnosing, then we can help present a cure. But if we give judgments and opinions, we're probably never going to get in on the chance of giving the cure for the hostility that might be apparent in the teenager. Some of the teenagers seem so snobbish. Why? Why do you suppose that's true? Don't just give your judgment snobbish. I won't have anything to do with them. They don't care about me. I want anything to do with them. A lot of times when you appear snobbish, it's because you think people don't want to have you around. And a lot of these teenagers don't believe people want them around. And we prove it sometimes. Uh, he, it might be that he really thinks he's somebody, and that's why he's acting so snobbish, appears snobbish. But I doubt it. That's seldom true. Most probably he feels inferior. He feels this thing that he doesn't have the experience. He's constantly told, hey, don't think you're so big, Buster. Uh, hey, young lady, let's just help, you know. They're constantly told that they don't have the experience. And they know it by themselves over and over because they make so many failures. Maybe they're different in some way, and it's hard to be different when you're a teenager. It's much easier to be different as you get to be an adult. But when you're a teenager and feel different, either you're a child put on a pedestal or you're a poor child or you're different in some way, it's very difficult. And so you put this snobbish air on, this I can take care of anything air. And a person who really can take care of anything doesn't have to act that way. So you can just about be assured that they don't think they're someone. Or they might be a hurt person. They might have been hurt as a child. You know, as you think about all those things, you don't excuse them for acting hostile or snobbish. It's just that it tempers your feeling toward them so that you're able to stay around them long enough to see the beauty in the teenager. And teenagers are beautiful. If you, if you stay around them long enough to know them, they're so much fun. We need them. We need the fun and it, that, that they give us. Exodus 15, 2 says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. My strength and my song. God's our strength and our song. But he uses people to keep that song in our hearts. Nehemiah eight ten b says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Take the joy of the Lord to teenagers and get it back from them. Job 38, 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, fun. Let's have some fun, some joy, some song. Psalm 4, 7, thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. Glad heart, a merry heart, a merry countenance. It's going to attract the teenagers. It's going to communicate something. It's going to say, come on into uh, 20s, your 20s and your 30s and your 40s. It's okay, jump in. It's going to be all right. You're going to get on through. Psalm 35, 9, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Psalm 100, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Kids aren't going to be able to resist you. When you have, a, they may make fun of you and say, oh, you know, but they still can't quite resist it. Psalm 126, 2, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. Let teenagers, communicate to teenagers that the Lord has done great things for you and that you don't have to be dull and drab because you're an adult. They're going to hate becoming an adult if they see that in you. Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Now some of you mothers say, but I'm so worried about my teenager. I'm so burdened. I know, I know. And yet the Lord says we can rejoice even at a time like that. Rejoice in the Lord always. So even at a time when you feel worried and concerned about your teenager, you, the best way to pull them back towards you and toward the Lord, if you feel there's a little problem, is to be a rejoicing person. Ecclesiastes 3, 4, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And sometimes we forget that time to laugh, a time to laugh. Laugh with the, laugh with the teenagers. Uh, have your little jokes ready. 
Oh, there's some of them are so corny, and the teenager goes, oh, mom, oh, our kids say, oh, dad, you know. But you know what's funny? They're beginning to say the same kind of jokes. <laughs> and, and they groan, but they kind and they say, you know what dad said today? It was so dumb. It was really, it was really stupid. You know, and uh, they've got an uncle the same way, Uncle Jerry. He, he, he's got those corny kind of jokes, too. And he gives one and then looks at you to see if you're going to laugh or not. And, you know, you just have to laugh because of the way he gives them. If the joke isn't funny, he's funny giving it. And uh, he, he, the, he relates to them. He communicates with them because he attempts to reach out to them. You're, what you give them might not be that great. Uh, sorry, Jerry. What you give them might not be that great, but the fact that you're attempting to m reach out and communicate with them and say something to them, they appreciate, even if they don't let you know it at the time. I was trying to think of a joke Brother Jerry said the other day. Uh, uh, oh, my. Uh, huh. Said, oh, dear. He said, you know, uh, he said, you know, why the, uh, the moron jokes, you know, why the moron stayed up all night? He was busy studying for his blood test. <laughs> you see what I mean? That kind of joke is so pitiful. It's funny. Ecclesiastes 8.15, Then I commanded mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry for that. And, of course, these are in the right way. Uh, the world takes this and, think, uh, and goes into a merriness that does not last. Uh, go ahead now for that uh, for that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God giveth, giveth him under the sun oh come on yet I will rejoice Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation Habakkuk 318 Luke 621 blessed are ye that hunger now for ye shall be filled blessed are ye that weep now for ye shall laugh rejoice evermore rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice Teenagers are going to see, they're gonna, you're going to communicate with them. You're going to get through if you're a rejoicing Christian. Oh, you might find a shy, quiet, withdrawn girl, but try to think maybe she feels unaccepted. She's scared. You accept her. You, sh you say something quiet back. You just kind of go up to her and let her know, I like, I, like that. I like that dress you have on. You know what I heard Mrs. Rice say to a guy the other day? She said, those eyes said they can't decide whether they're going to be brown or blue. They're, 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 they're just having a time, aren't they? And that let the boy laugh, and she didn't say, oh, you have beautiful eyes. She knew how to adjust her compliment uh, in a way that they could take. Maybe some of the teenager, maybe it's an obnoxious, loud person. Perhaps he's been put down and wants to be heard. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's love them. Let's pray. Let's treat, teach. Let's train. Let's ask God to help us. Each one of us needs help in order to know how to reach out and communicate so that we can touch for ourselves and for God these teenagers. <laughs>